explain that most monsters aren't born, they are created. And in this video, I'm going to show you some of those monsters. Here's one. And the corrupt apparatus for whom she works has just given her the Democratic Woman of the Year Award. Now, if that doesn't speak to the absolute moral bankruptcy of the liberal left, nothing does. Hillary Clinton won the Democratic Woman of the Year Award Thursday, and she brought her admiring audience of fallow imps at the Women's National Democratic Club to tears. Now, you really can't make this up, and the Daily Caller says... Award presenter Nucci Courier could barely contain her emotion when she remembered the last presidential election produced a result that was very different from what had been anticipated. Especially, Daily Caller notes, after Clinton secured the nomination through a rigged process. Which is why this other monster, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, had to step down as DNC chair. And who are some of the other DNC liberal left monsters? Well, there's this one, John Podesta who Andrew Breitbart described as a world-class underage sex slave op cover-upper, and this monster... People are smarter than we give them credit for. Tony Podesta, who has just had to step down from the powerful Podesta lobbying group in Washington, D.C., because Tony Podesta had Uranium One as a client. And don't forget about this monster, Uma Abedin, who, according to Anon, may be indicted on November 6th, our fingers are crossed, and, of course, her husband, a monster, Anthony Weiner, who is said to have 650,000 emails between Huma Abedin and Hillary Clinton, which, according to former Navy SEAL Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater, when the NYPD first got Weiner's computer, they discovered how horrific the material within it was, and they kept a copy of everything, and they passed on a copy to the FBI, trying to prompt Comey to reopen the investigation. Now again, as the mainstream media continues to cover for their Rothschild puppet, Hillary Clinton, they continue to malign any thought that Pizzagate is real and that there could be a problem with child sex trafficking in Washington, D.C. that includes politicians and powerful people. However, according to Eric Prince, in the 650,000 Anthony Weiner emails are indications of money laundering, underage sex, pay-for-play, and of course, plenty of proof of inappropriate handling of classified information. And according to True Pundit's Thomas Paine, in this interview with CrowdSource The Truth, Anthony Weiner's hard drive contained at least one very compromising video of the monstrous Hillary Clinton. I think that Hillary is going to shut up on a lot of this stuff because people know what was on that server that nobody, you know, wants to, wants to talk about. And, um, there were some videos on there, uh, compromising videos of Hillary, and that's all I'm going to say. We're going to cut it off right there. And if you think the FBI is going to release that video to the public, then you don't understand the deep state. And still, this monster... We came, we saw, <laughs> he died. ...is awarded with Democratic Woman of the Year by a morally, fundamentally, 100% bankrupt apparatus that worships at the altar of this New World Order demon. And even as the mainstream media tries to dismiss any allegations that child sex trafficking is a problem in Washington, D.C., on Wall Street, and among powerful circles of the elite... Eventually a name stuck, Pizzagate. There's this monster, Howie Rubin, a former portfolio manager for an investment fund founded by George Soros, who sexually abused women at a Manhattan penthouse dungeon, according to a $27 million Brooklyn federal suit. Rubin, 62, whose high-stakes dealing was featured in the best-selling books Liars Poker and The Big Short, rented the lavish metropolitan tower pad in Midtown to indulge in brutal sex with women whom he paid 2000 and 5000 per session. And I just want to read this quote to you to understand that Pizzagate, which is the problem of pedophilia and child trafficking, is very real. One of Rubin's accusers said that during her abuse, he said, and I quote, I'm going to rape you like I rape my daughter. And the next time the mainstream media tries to lie to you and tell you that Pizzagate is nothing more than the rantings of internet lunatics, this is how conspiracy theories are threaded together lie by lie. You'll want to recall this. Rubin, who collaborated with two female fixers and a lawyer, had the women sign non-disclosure agreements. 
the trio sought to, quote, cover up Rubin's sexual misconduct and criminal abuse of women and to serve as a cover for his wide-ranging human trafficking scheme. So when you think about the monsters that have been created, many of whom roam the highest echelons of power, you'll want to remember the faces. It's a dirty, dirty game that the New World Order is playing. These are greedy, bloodthirsty demons, men who will stop at nothing to get what they want. And considering that their ultimate goal is control of the entire world, this is a battle worth fighting. We all became cops, we all joined law enforcement to do good and to do right. And I think that's what everybody in this city, that's what everybody in this state, that's what everybody in this nation needs to understand. We did this because we want to do good. Nobody on this job is ever going to get rich. And we do it because we love what we do and we love the people of this great nation. That's James O'Neill who took the helm of the NYPD in September of last year. It's the largest police department in the nation by far with more than 50,000 paid employees and roughly 36,000 sworn officers and an annual budget of five billion dollars. O'Neill started as a transit cop 34 years ago and rose through the ranks to become chief of department. And one day after he was sworn in as commissioner, a terrorist set off a bomb in Chelsea, wounding dozens. And on Halloween, a vehicle attack on the West Side Highway killed eight. And Monday, a self-proclaimed ISIS sympathizer tried to kill himself and others near Times Square with a pipe bomb. So what dangers do we face next? Joining us now, the commissioner of the NYPD, James Jimmy O'Neill. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Hey, Rick. Glad to be here. So I don't want to call it a trend, but twice in six weeks, two terror attacks. Where is this going? Listen, we, we all have to pay attention in, in this city and in the nation to what's going on. Um, this past Monday, I make no mistake about it, it was a terror attack. But uh, we are in uh, New York City is lucky to have uh, the people that they have involved in, in protecting this great city. And it's not just the NYPD. It's, uh, it's, it's the FBI. It's the Joint Terrorist Task Force. Uh, it's the state troopers, it's the Port Authority police. Uh, the actions taken by the Port Authority police on Monday were absolutely, truly heroic. The, uh, the, the four or five cops that approached that, that, that bomber when he was still down, I'll tell you, it uh, takes a tremendous amount of courage, and, and I congratulate them for that, and I thank them for that. But we got lucky, because the suspect, the Kayatula, didn't make a very good bomb. What about the next time? No, he didn't, but we do have uh, the ability to investigate. And again, with the Joint Terrorist Task Force, we have about 100 detectives working with Bill Sweeney's people. He's the assistant director in, ch in charge. Our ability to investigate any threat, and we, we, we constantly monitor the threat stream. That's what we do. And any, any threat that's not investigated by the Joint Terrorist Task Force is investigated by Tom Galati's people in the Intelligence Bureau. I, I know that the FBI has about 1,000 people on a watch list. They're watching them. Do you have a similar list? Are you watching people right uh, now? The, the, um, the information we share with the FBI is absolutely seamless. And it hasn't always been that way. And, it, it's, uh, and it's, New York City is, is lucky to have that relationship because we, we don't miss much. Uh, the amount of work that goes into this, the commitment by uh, the, the FBI, the commitment by our detectives, it's, this is something we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know how you do it. Uh, and I know what I thought when I got the phone call that there was a terror attack in that pedestrian walkway below the Port Authority. What did you think when you got the call? I was at work. Um, there was uh, one of the guys on, uh, that I work with every day was, was on the phone, and I I just come into the office and I saw a look on his face, and, and I knew it was uh, I knew it was something real. Uh, we went out there immediately. Uh, John Miller was there. Tom Galati was there. And uh, we understood the situation. But, but what were you thinking? What does the commissioner of the NYPD think when he gets that horrible phone call? Uh, what I'm thinking is, all right, so now we have to take some affirmative steps here to keep everybody in this city safe. So I immediately reached out to John Miller, to, to Jim Waters, to uh, the chief of patrol, Terry Monahan, to Joe Fox, our chief of transit. And we had to make sure that we looked immediately, started looking for secondary devices. Yeah. Uh, two weeks from now, New Year's Eve, always a big security concern. Bigger this year, I would imagine, because of recent events. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, uh, I, used to, I used to love three or four days out of the year. I used to love Fourth of July. I used to love Thanksgiving. I used to love New Year's Eve. I still like them, but, but I want to get through them. But I know uh, the commitment of the, there's going to be thousands of, of NYPD officers, not just in Times Square, uh, but all around the city. And the work doesn't start that afternoon. We've been working on this since, uh, since January 2nd of uh, 2017. Are you, are you more worried this year? 
than years past. I, I, of course I'm concerned because we have to pay attention to what goes on, just not, not just in the city, but we have to go pay attention to what goes on around the world. So I, I am concerned, but we do have... Uh, we do have the plan. We have the counterterrorism overlay. We have the people from Manhattan South. We have people from the Critical Response Command, uh, Strategic yeah. Response Group, ESU. So we'll be ready. I just want to play this, this soundbite from when I interviewed you right before you took the helm uh, a year ago, September. Let's listen real quick and then get your reaction. Sure. This is one of the big differences in, uh, between the Commissioner Bratton and myself. He said when he came on that he knew one day he would be the commissioner. And uh, when I came on in uh, Jan January 5th, 1983, did I ever think that... Uh, no, I'd rise to his level. Absolutely not. You look younger there. <laughs> it's been it's been 15 months uh, since I took the job on September 16th, but uh, you know it's been a great great 15 months. I get to see uh, the great work that gets done by the courageous men and women of the NYPD each and every day, and I get to to interact with uh, the 8.6 million people of this great city. Well, you have a terrific responsibility, and we appreciate you handling it. I have the best job in the world, Rick. Well, then I have the second best. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner, very much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me here.